Let's talk about responsive web design. Um, so before we get started, you guys won't do that for it. Give me some things that are baffling you about old RWD. What do you want to know? Jeremiah. Wonderful. Breakpoints, great question. What else? What else do we want to know about responsiveness? Cat. Say it again. Mobile classes. Cool, what else? Uh, call those M sites. What else? Great. What else? Cool. What else? Sure. Sure. Tips, tricks, pitfalls. Awesome. That's a pretty good start. So um, let's start with a strategy that's broadly called mobile first design. There's actually things I, I really don't like about mobile first, but it's better than many of the alternatives. This is an overall strategy for making something responsive. The web is responsive by default. You make it unresponsive when you start, especially constraining widths and you try to use the horizontal axis. So the best strategy, this is the one that I use myself um, when I start planning is make what's called a content inventory. The idea of a content inventory is you're figuring out what are the elements that I need to work with. So like if I go, why not this site? Like okay, this is the uh, site that I'm trying to design. What are the items that I have on here? Well, I have the name of the page, I've got uh, a list of breadcrumbs, I've got a menu uh, heading, I've got a menu menu navigation options, I've got the text content here, you all right? Uh, we got a horizontal rule, we have another heading. So what you do is you take all of these and you just write them out. And this is usually before you have any kind of idea what it's going to look like, but you do know that these are the things that you need to display. So when you write all these out, you go, all right, well, I got this heading, I got a logo, I have a nav list. You figure out what all these things are, and then you give them a priority. You go, okay, if I have to force rank these, what's important, what's not? Well, I guess that'd be three, two, one. So then you rearrange it so they're in the right order. And then your goal is, like a place you can start is literally just do all of those in order. So if it was that, 
That would be, all right, I've got a logo, a nav list, and then a heading. So we start here, and then the mobile first strategy is as we expand that, when does it start to change? So maybe it starts there, and then with a wider viewport, that turns into logo, and then the, uh, maybe I have like a nav over here, and then the heading here. But you're starting with this single column, and then as you get more space, you make decisions about what would go where. This is the mobile first approach. Uh, I mentioned that like, there's actually a process I like kind of a little bit more. Um, and I, it starts the exact same way with the content inventory. And your mobile layout looks like this. But mobile first is, all right, you get a little bit more width, a little bit more width, a little bit more width, what do you do? I think of it more like, what, um, how many designs do I have to make? And I approach those each independently without any prejudice about what the other one was. Um, they're both completely valid, but that is like my very minor um, niggle about uh, mobile first approach. So um, questions about content inventories and then single column to out. Most important trick in responsive design is be very careful about your horizontal space. On your smallest viewport, you're not gonna be able to use it. Like, that's basically the rule. Even if you have something like a slidey container or something like that, the element is still here. It just has a horizontal navigation. But you really don't get to put things side by side. So all you have to work with is contrast, size, spacing, that kind of stuff to create a hierarchy. Let's say I wanted to do this. How would I approach that? Looks like I have a breakpoint. Let's, uh, let's try coding that out. the uh, stuff I was just using in the last lesson. Okay, nothing up this sleeve, nothing up this sleeve. I'm trying to have a logo, a nav list, and a heading. So uh, if I'm trying to do this in one column, then uh, I'm probably doing something like image, Yeah, <laughs> whatever this is. Oh, by the way, has anybody figured out what these are? Correct. That's not a link to an image. That is the image. It's what's called a base 64 encoding. 
So we take all the ones and zeros that make up that binary file, and then we use base64 to represent them instead of base2. And so we end up with something that's small enough that we can represent it as a URL. They're called data URLs. So, And then, what was it, a uh, nav list and a heading. All right, so I've got a logo, a nav list, and a heading. Sick. So if I try serving this up, what do I get? Great. Um, one, uh, if you try pulling this up on a phone, it's a pretty good chance it won't look like this. Um, Corey Hemplo. If I turn on the mobile emulator, like, these end up just getting small as shit. Uh, and if you've tried looking at any of your sites on your phone, there's like a not zero chance that it like, it's like, why is everything so small? Why is it all zoomed out and shit? There's one tag you can add that fixes this. Um, it's called the responsive meta tag. And all you have to do is put this in your header, in your header. Seems simple. And I don't know that it actually changes it with this, but if you've ever seen that on your site before where everything's just super tiny, um, that's the one that you want to use. Cool. That's another tip and trick. All right, let's take a look at how we might um, breakpoint this so that as this gets bigger, I get that two column thing I'm, I'm trying to get. See, HTML is already responsive. You just make it unresponsive. All right, so hop over to the CSS. It's style. Bless you! Um, the, oh, hang on, quick tangent, speaking of which. I saw Hard Times headline the other day, it had me cracking up. Um, man referring to old church youth group as scene he grew up in. Um, and then <laughs> there's this line in there where this guy is, I'm not familiar with punk rock, but let me see if I understand this correctly. A punk scene is a small community of people that support and care for one another despite their differences, while also providing wayward souls with a sense of belonging. And many of these so-called punks don't engage in drinking, drugs, or promiscuous sex. Are you sure this isn't a Christian-affiliated organization? <laughs> um, anyway, what was I? So uh, before I, I hop into this, too, like we can make this not look like shit uh, with very little effort. We hop over to Google Fonts. And I'm like losing my mind since I found out this trick. Pick the style you want. Let's go with a sans serif. 
and under font, font properties, number of styles, and go with one that just has a ton of styles. Uh, typefaces that are really well designed tend to have a bunch of styles associated with them. And so like, you take your million options from Google fonts and narrow it down to this. Um, and like unsurprisingly, these are like some of the most popular typefaces in the world. So let's go with uh, Montserrat. And if I import that in, Ah, oh, already, getting better. And see, I want that logo, it's too high. So I'm gonna say, give that a class. Okay, it's a little bit better. Um, I'm gonna do the resets by hand. So I'll say I want no padding on the body, no margin on the body. Nice. And how's about, I throw that in a header. and then give the header some padding. Nice, a little too much. And then maybe I throw all of these in a main. And I give main that padding also. Okay. And then those nav links will be a reset out the padding left on them and set their list style type to none. All right. Now we're getting somewhere. Um, okay. And now when I make this bigger, I want this and this to go side by side. So the magic trick on this is called a breakpoint. So you do a breakpoint by saying at media and then when you want it to break. Um, you can have multiple conditions, all sorts of other stuff. The media rules, which are what those are called. They say only if it's a string, you may not realize this, but you can do style sheets that are specifically for like print, for example. Um, and then you can do some like basic Boolean logic, like ands and ors and stuff. And then say some kind of property that you want it to keep an eye on. So number of bits per color component for the output device. So you can do a different style sheet for something that has low color resolution and a different one that for ones that have high color resolution. Um, max height, min height, min width, max width. Um, is the primary input mechanism a pointing device? So like, there's a lot of stuff that you can query off of. The most common one though is um, min and max width. And I'd say min width is probably more common than the other way around. So this is gonna be your break point. Um, let's say I wanna break at 400 pixels. Now, what I get to do inside of this is put any rules that I want and they'll only apply if the screen is 400 pixels or bigger. So as this gets bigger, a really common thing 
is you want to add like more padding. So I can take this exact rule. and like jack up the padding. So now it's Oop, not triggering. I don't think I actually have to put it in the uh, parentheses. Let me see. There we go. Apparently I do. So as I bring this in, you'll see that collapse right there. All right, so since we're in that, um, in that breakpoint, we can put other things that we want to happen when we get bigger. So one of those is like we want the um, nav and that heading to go side by side. So maybe when we hit that, we just flex the main. Um, this should probably be wrapped in like a section or something. We go, okay, main starts flexing once we're over 400 pixels and I want it to flex um, row, wrap, cool. So now they're side by side. And when they get smaller, it collapses. And maybe I want mains sections to have a left margin of three rams. And maybe when they're, I could even do, so, I don't think this is actually a good idea, but I could do something like, um, those ULs should also, those should be display in line, except when they're in this breakpoint, in which case you do, actually, I really want the LI to be in line. Then I want them to be block. And so they're next to each other now, and then they go in a column. But again, you generally don't want to use your horizontal space at all if you can help it in a response in a mobile design. You see how much different we can make shit look without changing the HTML. Like, that's why I'm harping on you guys so much about semantics, semantics, semantics. Fuck how it looks. If, you, if it's matching your content inventory, if the priorities are there, if things are grouped correctly, like, the entire idea is that how something looks is a reflection of that hierarchy. And so you shouldn't have to mess with stuff that much. And even in the rare cases where you do, I've showed you guys flex order before, right? Like, let's say that in the mobile view, I wanted to actually flip the navigation and the uh, section. Then I can do something like main section, main nav. All right, on the big screen, I want the nav to be order two and this to be order one. And now, oh, you can flip them. So it's like unforgivably lazy to me when I see uh, a document structure that's just a reflection of how it looks and like disrespects the semantics of it. Uh, I 
would not recommend doing that. Um, it's super attractive to like have those as like completely discrete styles, but there's it's almost never the case that you're actually writing a complete from scratch style sheet with something where they look completely different. So you do want to reuse a bunch of things, and that means you need to like kind of be aware of what the hierarchy is. But I'll give you an example of how you can organize this stuff. With a project of almost any size, yeah, this style.css file, fuck off, man. Like, that's just gonna get out of control. But uh, if we can use SCSS, this entire game changes. So I'm gonna show you guys the Develop Denver responsive design, which I did myself. And if you're unfamiliar, So this is this site, and then the responsiveness, the, there's only one breakpoint on this, but it happens right there. And like the placement of the menu changes, that hamburger shows up. Um, all that stuff is, uh, is different. So let's take a look at how I did it. So I generally split uh, style sheets out. Like I'll have these kind of utility ones, like defining colors. In this case, it's a brutalist site, so there's only black, white, and an accent color. That's all the colors on the site. Um, I have these mix-ins, which I, I think are kind of what you're talking about. Like they'll, they'll achieve some of the things that you'd like, uh, Jeremiah, where I can have something like call to action. Call to action is this button right here. That style is defined in one place, and any component can import this mix-in and apply all these rules to any other rule. So I can say this button should apply a call to action, and then it just gets all these properties. Sure. So if I go to something, see that one is in. What is that one called? this join us link right here. So it has a class of button, and button includes call to action. Um, so yeah, and then I also have my grid system defined in here. Works the exact same way. Anything I want to apply our like custom nine column grid can just include the grid, and now it has it. Uh, a mix-in in CSS is I would like to combine these styles with whatever styles you're currently using. In just software engineering in general, I maybe have a this object, and I can mix in this other object. And the result is those two things mashed together. So it's how um, uh, you may have like read somewhere like inheritance is like the worst thing in OSP. It is. Um, and part of like the trouble with it is you can only inherit from one other class, like on any OSP language. The way around that is you uh, have other classes that you mix in to a class. And then instead of like a uh, trying to create this elegant hierarchy where a, um, a person is a mammal, which is a living thing, and like you get this hierarchy that gets very brittle very quickly. You can say, okay, the things I care about are can walk, can run. Um, I don't make sure you can fly, but I define all of these like, properties and behaviors 
kind of like sort of assembled like a regular rather than trying to start general and then specific. It's the exact same thing in the CSS one. But broadly, we call these mix-ins. So think of it as like an alternative to a parent class, because we can have a lot of them. Depends on where you put it in the order. So like if I have two things that conflict, it's like, eh, I basically want this one, but I might have an override for it. You just put it second. Um, and so, okay, this is a great example of like how I handle the thing that you're talking about, Jeremiah. When I have these things like a grid heading. So in the desktop view, that's like these things right here. In the desktop view, they start on like grid line three, I think. So there's the grid, and it starts, yeah, on grid line three, and then spans the rest of it. On mobile, though, and I wanted to do that. On mobile, I want it to collapse and just take up one column, because I don't want to try to use that horizontal space. Yeah, see, now it's all one column. And the way that I did that is in the mix-in, Cool, it should start on three and span eight columns. Should be eight. But at this break point, I want it to just be one. And now when I mix that in, it gets the media rule also. So that one comes from another one of these kind of general files, a thing called sizes. Oh, I guess I do have a second break point on this. Correct. Uh, they're SAS variables, but they're, yeah, they're just variables. And so anything can import those and then use them like they were declared here, like the colors, accent color, all that kind of stuff. Pretty fucking cool. And then when there's like little stuff that needs breakpoint magic, let's see if I can find one. See, like you, you try to extract that stuff into little utilities like call to action, because if it's so useful, there's a pretty good chance that it like doesn't belong in the uh, component itself, the hamburger menu. Yeah, so like you can just throw it in here. Like these social links, they get a lot smaller on mobile, and so you just add a rule for that. It seems like that would be messier than having a completely different mobile style sheet, but like it's super not. Because when you aren't using images for these things anymore, you're just using words. All of it is in one place, so you delete that, and now there's no more styles to worry about. Otherwise, you change something fundamental about the layout of your site, and look, uh-oh. Now I gotta figure out everywhere that I just had some orphan shit styles laying around. It's too much work. Cool. Uh, as far as what you pick your set your breakpoints to, there's some good baselines out there um, that'll help you get started, but you always have to customize these. Whatever your design is, you're gonna start expanding it, you'll know. <coughs> and you'll especially know if it's wrong. Because they'll usually be about 100, 200, 300 pixels of width, where it's like, oof, I hope nobody happens to like have their device like exactly this size. This is like crap. Um, and so that means your breakpoint needs to happen before that. And then have as many as you need. It's like as you get bigger, it's like, oof, these things are, this text is unreadably long or uh, this just has so much empty space. You apply all the design principles at every like, individual step of this, and you end up with as many big points as you need to have. Um, 
if you look up like the standard breakpoint sizes, you'll pretty much just get bootstraps. And it, it is helpful sometimes to consult these um, tables of like for tablet and PC monitors or smartphones or tablets this way or tablets this way. But if you, so there you go, there's like, this is almost absolutely what Bootstrap uses. Um, so you can have those breakpoints in there if you want, but always, always customize it to your style because there's a 100% chance that these aren't completely right for what you want. And you want it to like work well too, even if it's not necessarily a phone, but it's somebody just splitting their screen like that. What questions have you so far? Yeah. UI person? You are the UI person. You are the front end person. Yes. Uh, if you do have like a design team or something, not only will they tell you what to do, but they'll be jerks about it. Um, and I know that you think this doesn't matter, but this is actually four pixels off of kind of like where it was in my Photoshop thing. Um, I am advocating for a world where like, it is easier for you as a professional problem solver to pick up their craft than it is for them to pick up yours. So put them out of business. <laughs> like, spend a couple years learning how to do this and now like, that's a pretty good value proposition for a company. Of, like, I don't, you don't need another person to do the other half of my job. Well, you can you can simulate it on like design tools and stuff, um, or but there honestly nothing beats, and you should do this with your project, especially with capstones. Like, throw it on one of these monitors because especially if you're doing fixed widths or something. If you never check, there's a good chance on like a jumbo screen like this, you're gonna see something fucking weird. But it's also worth mentioning too that this isn't like. Uh, 20,000 pixels wide or something. The pixels are huge. It's still 2,000 or whatever, but um, yeah, get something that's very big and make sure your stuff holds up. Um, and that's, that's the best way to check. Failing that, this, uh, the mobile emulator is pretty good, man. Just throw that thing on. It gives you a decent sense. And you could even like pick specific ones, like that's an iPad, if that's an iPad on its side. Um, this is an iPhone X, iPhone X on its side. You can also throttle the network, for like good 2G. How, how usable is that like enormous fetch request you're making? You can also turn this on, which will Should. I don't know why it's still showing me the cursor. Um, it'll do actual touch events also, not mouse click events, which is also kind of useful. Um, Firefox. Chrome has the exact same one. Cool. Um, mobile classes and M sites, don't do them. Um, they're M sites were like the way that people did responsiveness five, six, seven years ago. And like they're a complete fucking nightmare. Because uh, the likelihood that you're going to be able to keep your M site and your regular site in sync, zero. Uh, and so you just end up with twice as much work to do. Um, so I am super anti M site. And I don't like mobile classes 
Why? Why, why don't you think I like mobile classes? They're not very. I heard it. Semantic. What device you're viewing something on has nothing to do with its semantic hierarchy. And once you start throwing those things in, uh, mobile classes, display classes, any of those kinds of things, like you get addicted to them for one. Now that you're not uh, respecting your document hierarchy anymore, you have to start just throwing divs everywhere to make something look a particular way. Find a way around it. There's always a way, and uh, it's just it's never necessary to do it that way. Now, I'll give you one exception. This should still be used really sparingly, but uh, it does technically work. If I look at, I'm trying to think if I actually did it in this app. I might not have. But if I go to the index, let's see, not on that one. Maybe in the hero banner. Shoot, not this one either. Sometimes you can conditionally render a component, uh, like you store breakpoints in like your JS framework, and then you can reference them as like conditionals here. So like if um, greater than medium breakpoint or whatever, then render this component. But you can also do that stuff with styling and just use display none and those kinds of things. And that's, that's a more durable way to do that. Uh, I've talked about CSS strategy a bit. VH and VW, what do those mean? Yep, what, what, what does that mean? Yep, that's it. Um, how are they measured? Nope. Percent. A hundred VH is the total height of the window. Fifty VH is half the height of the window, and it changes. Like if that updates, like those recalculate. Um, and you will see those combined with calc a lot. Like this is this is a super quick and dirty way to do the thing where, let's see. if I want to have a footer that's down at the bottom of this page, check this out. So I add a footer, small is the HTML tag for the fine print. Okay, womp womp, there's not enough content on the page, so it doesn't go all the way down. So, what you can do, you can set the body to min height 100 vh. Okay, that's step one. You can also try to do something cheap, like, um, I set the header main the height of this is some fixed thing um, and this is some thing and this is a hundred percent. The problem is like that'll oops 
Should work. Oh, is it some flexam? That's because I'm flexam. Well, you take up this, and you take up this. Oh, weird. That should be trying to take up all the space. Because I'm in the mobile emulator. How strange. There's a new, um, there's a new feature that's coming out that I'm kind of excited about that will tell you when you're doing a property that doesn't apply because, for example, if parent is flexed, So you could do something like that, but then you have an unnecessarily unnecessary scroll. So like a way that you can get around that with calc. Calc is like a function. You can do an expression. You like do math. So you can say I want 100 uh, viewport height minus um, how big is this footer? This footer is. 85 pixels high, minus 85 pixels, minus header is 181, and oops, I should have done it. Oh, it's because I might not be taking into account their padding. Hundred and eighty one Getting there. Okay. I feel like this is because I have some reset on, or because I'm not using my reset. Okay, scroll bar is still there, so it's. There we go. You can do some tricks like that uh, with calc. There's actually some, there's even better ways you can do that with grid. Um, but like this is like the cheapest way to do that. And that's why I see calc used for the most. But yeah, if it needs to be an expression, that's what you would do. What else do you want to know? Semantic UI is a framework. Correct. So I can't for the fucking life of me why they think this is semantic. But <laughs> um, you have these classes in here and uh, you add all these little display classes and they apply styles. Just like Bootstrap or Foundation or any of those. Human-friendly HTML is always like code for I don't know how to write HTML. <laughs> Semantic UI treats words and classes as exchangeable concepts. Get the same benefits as BEM or Smacks, but without the <laughs> tedium. Nope, just learn how to write CSS. Mm -hmm. Cool, what else? What else do you want to know?
No. Yes. There's a more semantic way to do it, though. It's vaguely hacky, um, but does work. Um, I think I actually do it on the menu for Develop Denver. like almost always like it's not hard to do and every time I start something without SCSS I like regret it almost instantly Yeah, so okay, here's what I did on this one. I have this, which I have a Z index that's pushing it on top. And so like if I don't do that, it just gets mangled with the rest of the stuff. And then I have this uh, opaque background color. But if it's an image, then you can add more than one uh, image to something. And so I think you might be able to do more than one color also. Let's see. Multiple background images and colors. Cool. So Let's say I wanted to, yeah, let's give this a shot. This body is going to have, error. let's see, let's do it this way. The header will have a background of the URL and pull some background image. Hell yeah. And then um, Okay, so let's see if I can get the um, get that to show up. Might have to reverse the order, maybe. Does that do it? Nope. Let's see what that. Well, I'll set it again. Background. Hell 
have to be on completely opaque backgrounds though. Okay, I think I can do the background shorthand and a background color. Let's try that. They're both on there though. Weird. All right, I want to try. So let's see what that would look like with a. Um, they're called scrims. So this is super not semantic. Every once in a while you have to break it. But if I make a scrim in here. And do dot scrim uh, height 100%, width 100%. All right, now I'm getting somewhere. Then I'm going to make the header. Ah, ah. I'm going to make the header uh, position relative and this position absolute. The right size now. I don't know why it's so why it's offset like that. So totally offset, bro. So that should have taken it out of oop, the image is like that too. Because of the pattern? No. Huh. How strange. Yeah, you can see that it's the right height. Yeah. I'm curious why it's offsetting it like that. Because that is also, what if I dock to bottom? How strange. Where there's a will, there's a way. Cool. And then, <laughs> but, um, then I can do something like that. And so it's inside the scrim. Make that white. And I can display flex, align item center, uh, justify content center. There you go. 
<laughs> There's your scrimmed text. There is a way to do that without the extra div, though. Um, but that works. Oh, and then like, so this image, this image is behind the scrim. Uh, the way you get around that, is, yeah, you Z index it. Although once you start Z indexing, it's very hard to stop. Um, it, it's like a drug, except it fucks up your, <laughs> your site. Um, what? I didn't catch that. It's still behind the scrim. Weird. Kinda. So, um, let me look up the shorthand CSS background. There's a couple things that we can do with backgrounds. It's so like we can tell it how we want it to repeat. Um, And a really common one is a formal syntax. Mm, let's see, background, CSS, cover, background size. And this will. But now it doesn't pile anymore. It just stretched out the image to where like it would cover the entire thing. Um, you can also do something like no repeat, and it won't stretch. It. Oh, this did repeat it. Nifty, no repeat. X. Something like that. Ah, it's background repeat. And now, even if it's like not enough, it just won't do it. And so you can give it a background color also. Um, or if you want it to be a particular size, you can say like 20 pixels by 50 pixels and pile it that way. Cool. What else? Uh, just the uh, display sticky. Oh yeah, you need to account for that. Yeah. So the best way to do that is to um, fix how big your header is going to be and then make sure that it always has a margin of that. And then you can additionally pad it. So if your sticky header is 45 pixels high, um, give any content in that a body of, or a, a mar top margin of 45 pixels and then some additional padding. Um, you could, no, it'd be like at the top of the sections. Um, so every section that you're going past that you want that like the header to accumulate on, you'd add it on those. Um, you can't do it on the header itself because the header isn't in the document flow anymore. What else? Thank you.